What's up, are you? Everybody doing good today? Yeah? Summer really uh, embraced us once again with the heat. Last week it was, it was really awesome. I went up for some morning runs and I just felt like I could do another mile, you know? It was just that cool. I ran yesterday and if you saw me on North Lamar, you would have thought I was just dying. I was just like dripping sweat. It was just disgusting. Um, so my name is Connor. Welcome. <laughs> uh, this is my last week here, and if I haven't met you, um, I would love to meet you, uh, hear your name, to get to know you a little bit before I go back to Atlanta. Um, I have, y'all, this is a really awesome church. I don't know if you're visiting or if you've been here for several years, like, this church has got it going on. Um, and I've just loved uh, playing with your kids during VBS, um, going to Costa Rica and playing paintball with your youth, um, and I've enjoyed worshiping with you all, so um, it's been, it's been really awesome, and I just thank you for welcoming me into this community. I feel very loved and empowered by a lot of you in this room right now. Um, uh, I came here to speak, uh, but before I do that, let's pray a little bit. God, we thank you for, for the morning, for creating a new day that's not marked by our past, that's not marked by, not marked by what does not define us, but God, we thank you for creating. God, we ask that you reveal to us what it is that you want to be revealed to us today. God, open our hearts and bring in your hope that empowers, brings life, and fulfills the deepest desire of our hearts. Holy Spirit, we ask that you empower us today and as we leave this place. You're going to let me pray. Amen. A uh, show of hands, who here has been caving or spelunking? People call it different things. A few of y'all? Yeah, it's really fun. Uh, whenever you go caving or spelunking, you'll need to crawl through a lot of small spaces, climb up ladders and rock walls, and all the while you're surrounded by almost complete and total darkness. Because of all these things that caving demands, you can assume that it would be beneficial to not be afraid of the dark, not be afraid of heights, not be claustrophobic, or not have asthma. Well, John had all of these things. John was a middle schooler that came with us on our caving trip because he really wanted to conquer some fears and go beyond what he thought he was capable of. In the minutes before we enter the cave, uh, you can see John starting to get nervous. It's, it's on his face. When we start passing through the open parts of the cave to drop our sleeping gear, um, John's anxiety is becoming more and more apparent. Before we start our cave hike, John asked me, do we have to do this? And I was like, come on, John, you're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, two minutes into the hike, the walls have started closing in around us. John is right in front of me. And then we get to the first ladder, and the tears start to flow. And boy, do they flow. Talk about encountering creation, am I right? I'm trying to encourage John that he is safe with me and the other counselors that I'm here to help him, that he's already brave for stepping out of his comfort zone and trying out this new thing. But John just kept saying how in front of him there was darkness he couldn't see through, ladders he couldn't climb, and crevices he couldn't crawl through. I admitted to him, yes, there were obstacles in front of him, a lot of them. But once you get past all of those things that you think you can't handle, there's the end of the tunnel. And there's victory there. There's a, a light. There's the knowledge that you did what you set out to do. And we hope that encouraging John would work. We are trying to get John to focus on the future. What John was experiencing is really no different than what we often experience. We look at our, our lives, see all of our problems, our mistakes, our obstacles, and we have a hard time even dwelling on our future because our present can be just so unbearable at times. And we forget what our hope is. Do we even have a hope for our future? Or is there just darkness around us? This is the last sermon in a summer-long series about how we can interact with God's creation. And today, I wanted to talk about where our hopes lie. I want to talk about where our hopes lie because God's creative presence and power 
is not just something that we can remember in the past or be thankful for in the present, but it is also something that secures a good future for us and for the world and for the nations. Let's talk about that future. So the Revelation of John is a different kind of book. This is in your grandmother's Bible story. There are dragons, there are plagues that are poured out of bowls onto the earth. There are four horsemen of the apocalypse. There are beasts. It's a pretty wild read. But at the end of all of it, you see this vision of the end. And I think the end might be the most important part. Apocalyptic writings are meant to show you something, something that's going to happen. And in this case, the thing that we're supposed to see is what God is doing with creation in the end. John starts by telling us in verse 1 that he saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, new is being repeated for a reason here, new heaven, new earth. So at least we know by just this verse that this new cosmos is unlike the old, unlike what we're familiar with. But we can't fully picture what that is like in this verse alone. The sea was no more. For readers in the ancient world that this book was written, the sea was a symbol of nature's power, nature's destructive power. So what we can interpret from this is that God is making a new landscape for us to dwell in, and there's no more danger or harm that can come to you in this new place. John goes on in verse 2, And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What's interesting about this vision is that heaven is coming down to earth. We're not escaping this world and fly, fly away, oh glory, and flying up to heaven. And I've never thought about it this way, but God is coming down to where we are. Why, why Jerusalem? Why, does it, why doesn't he just stop at Holy City? One thing, that can come to, one thing that can come to our minds when we read New Jerusalem, and one thing that probably would have come to the minds of the ancient readers, is the people of Israel, God's people. If we open up our Bibles to the stories of the Old Testament, we'll see story after story of God leading the people of Israel, teaching them, coming, in, coming into conflict with them, and having mercy on them. So God has walked alongside Israel across time, and God continues making that people a new creation, all the way up to this moment. So by Israel being recalled into our memory, we can believe that God does not just transform in the end. God transforms now and continues to make all creation into something beautiful, being likened to a bride. Can that be true for us in this room? Could God be creating in us something beautiful? The vision then shifts a little bit from what John is seeing to what John is hearing. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. So now we're just getting repetitive. Uh, God is among them, God will be with them, God will be with them. Something that it took me a long time to learn is that when the Bible repeat something, it's probably important that you start listening. The point being made is that God is with us. God will live among us, and that's good news in and of itself. But the specific word is where it gets really interesting. The Greek word skenao is used, and it means to tent, to tabernacle, to dwell, to live. Outside the book of Revelation, the only other time that this word skenao is used is John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us. So it's not the idea of God that will be living among us. 
It's not the presence of God boxed behind four walls, but, and it's crazy to imagine this, it's the embodied, the person of God that will be living among us. Now before, this would have been a problem. We could not touch the holiness of God and live. You bumped your hip into that ark, you're like dust, you're dead. We were fallen and broken, and the holiness of God, like a consuming fire, just consumes that which is sinful. But by this point in the story, everyone, we have been reconciled. Just like in that Colossians passage we talked about last week, Christ is reconciling everything to himself. There is no longer any barrier that is keeping us from having right relationship with God. There is peace and safety in this new dwelling place. But the vision just keeps getting better. Y'all ready for the better part? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Trustworthy and true. Now we're getting more and more details about this newness. Is newness a word? It sounds weird. That John is seeing, and a world without pain, death, mourning, and crying is amazing. But for some of us in this room that have lost someone close to you, either recently or a few years ago, or for some of you that have experienced depression, this future does not sound that believable. A world without disappointment, a a world without someone close to me dying, yeah, right. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to feel that way, but I will say this. When other people's words of comfort did not prove strong enough, when healing over time did not prove strong enough, when, any, when anything we do to comfort ourselves and those we care about does not prove strong enough, this future is. I believe that because this future is not based on just my experiences, my failures, and my losses, or your experiences, your failures, and your losses, but it is based on the creative power of God. A God who is creating a future far greater than anything we can imagine. And sometimes we can't imagine a world without sin and death. But God is taking away those things that once dragged us down. And John says that this promise is trustworthy and true. You can stake your hope in it. Finishing up the vision John writes uh, in verse five, verse 6, Then he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. God gets the final say in this newly formed universe. God was the author in the beginning, and he's the final editor in the end. We then get three categories of people. There's the thirsty, the conquerors, let's just call them the faithless, just to use a blanket term. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift, from the spring of the water of life. To thirst is a really powerful image in scripture. It harkens back for me to the story in John 4 of the woman at the well. Jesus meets this woman who's had a very difficult life. Uh, He meets her and he tells her that, hey, I have some water, and if you drink of it, you'll never be thirsty again. You'll never want again. The deepest desires of your heart will be fulfilled. And that water is eternal life through me, through believing in me, believing that I died for you so that you could have life through me. This vision echoes that truth, that God is making a world in which our hearts are forever satisfied and nourished by the life that he brings. Then there's the conquerors, the second group. Those who conquer will inherit these things and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Now, conquerors could refer to those that have 
kept their faith in the context of the story of Revelation, if you read the rest of the book. It could apply to us who keep our faith in general to the end. But what's interesting here is the very personal relationship that the conquerors have with God. They will be my children. This is not a desensitized world God is creating. It's not impersonal. It's not passive. God is actively claiming ownership over us as our father and us as our children. That's what we have to look forward to. Now, I want to talk about the last verse in this passage, verse 8, the lake of fire one. Um, it's a tough read. Uh, but as for, the coward, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the idolaters, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, the liars, all errs, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There are two ways I see that we can look at it, this verse, and I'm sure there's more than just two. Um, but these two ways are not mutually exclusive. They can work together in tandem. We can see this verse as a warning that we should avoid and not let these sins dominate our lives, live a life apart from these things because God, God knows that these sins only bring unhappiness, strife, and death. We can view it that way. We can also view this verse as a call to rejoice. We have all committed or been hurt by many of the sins on this list. So a world where God is taking away these things that have plagued our lives and deprived us of joy, life, and justice— that's something to celebrate. That is something to celebrate. God is forever destroying and bringing these things away that have made our lives terrible, that have brought us so much unhappiness. We've lost joy and peace. That have made things, that these sins have made everything difficult, and God is taking those sins away. That's good news in and of itself. So we've received this vision of our future, and it is good. But what do we do with it? What do we do with it? Do we treat this vision as a symbolic gesture and not something that we can really stake our hope in? If we do believe it, do we just sit around waiting for this promise to be fulfilled? Or do we treat it as a living hope? In a sermon given on Revelation 21, Tim Keller said, the way you live now is completely controlled by what you think about your future. I'm going to say it one more time, and it's up there. The way you live now is completely controlled by what you think about your future. Now, I believe that statement was true, and it was especially true for the original readers of this text. John was writing to the churches of Asia Minor, and you can see that in the first few chapters of this book. John was writing to them because these early Christian communities were experiencing tremendous persecution by the Roman authorities. At any moment, these believers could lose their homes, be imprisoned, or be executed. So rather than just seeing this while on the island of Patmos, John wrote this down to provide immediate and powerful hope for early Christians who were in immediate danger. And this promise affected the way early Christians acted. We have accounts of these people singing hymns before being executed, forgiving their captors, and having a sense of peace in spite of their terrible circumstances. They operated this way because they saw this vision as trustworthy and true. Fast forward 2,000 years later, here we are gathered in this space as our millions of other people around the world gather on this day to celebrate Jesus and to praise God. And I have to believe it's because of the way that these early Christians acted. Because as people saw the suffering that they were going through, people on the outside witnessing these executions, they see these people and they're like, that guy has something I've never had. Those people are holding on to this hope that gives them so much peace and life in spite of their 
great suffering, and I've never had that. What is that? I have to believe that's what got the ball rolling. Hope in this vision has sustained not only the church, but it it sustains our lives. Now let's bring it back to our context and our world. We're not under the same kind of threat as the original readers of this text were. And praise God for that. However, we all experience discouragement. Everyone here has been discouraged. Failure, shame. We've all experienced those things. Some of us have experienced deep despair and even depression. But we can have joy in our lives today if we believe that this vision is coming. It's coming. When we are discouraged today, we can be confident that God is creating a world that does not contain our old mistakes and even our old selves. When we fail today, we can be uplifted by the hope that we will one day not feel so ground down and worthless. When someone close to us has died, we can rest in the fact that death no longer has the final say. God does. All that remains right now is the shadow of death. When we feel like nothing ever changes, we can live with the knowledge that one day God is coming down to the world again with heaven in tow and transforming everything. We all need immediate and powerful hope that we cannot create for ourselves. And that hope can come from a word, presence, and power that is not our own, but comes from God. There's a world coming where our fears have lost to the hope that we have. Going back to the story, after we encouraged John for a while, there was what seemed like a miraculous shift, and it it felt miraculous because, man, it was a while. And John starts going through the cave, and he's crawling like twice as fast as I am, so I'm just trying to keep up at this point. And I asked him when we finished, two hours later, what was it that got him going and gave him peace about all the things he was afraid of? And I do remember that he said this, I just focused on the end, and that got me going. I just focused on the end, and that got me going. He focused on the end goal, and that affected the way that he lived. The world, the world we live in is still broken. We feel that brokenness in our, commu- in our community when there is a murder that has shaken us and grieved us, or when the racist actions of a few show us that hatred is still alive and active in the world. At times it may seem like the walls of darkness are closing in around us. We have no room to breathe, and you just can't find enough hope to get out of bed some days. But here's the good news. The creative work of God will one day be complete. It's partial now. We can wait for it, hope for it, and live our lives with the grain of that hope. When there is death, we can speak words of life because we know that one day, death will be no more. We don't have to be afraid of death or mourning or crying or pain. We don't have to hide from them or seek to escape from them because we know that our problems and these realities are not permanent. They're passing away. And in their place, God is creating something new and something good. Will you all pray with me? God, we thank you that you are creating for us a world and a life where there is no more pain and death and need to cry. God, we wait for that day. God, we admit to you 
that it is hard sometimes when we lose people that are close to us, when we feel discouraged by our own sin, when we feel so beaten and ground down by what the world throws at us that we feel like we can't even get up sometimes. But God, we know that your promise is coming. God, not just that it's in the distance and it doesn't affect us, but God, we will live with that joy and hope that one day you are making all things new and setting every wrong thing right. God, we praise your name today. We're going to praise your name Monday too because you're making us a new creation and you're creating something amazing in all of humanity and in our world and in the entire universe. We thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen.